Dear friends, welcome to Inquest, in-depth analysis and to the point. Dear friends, in this session, let us discuss about first week September current affairs taken from the Hindu Deccan Herald and Press Information Bureau. And this activity is useful for your UPSC civil services, KPSC gazetted professionals examinations and all other competitive examinations. Dear friends, before getting into the news in detail, let us talk about the index of today's discussion. Number one, China to require foreign vessels to report in territorial waters. Number two, no social impact study for Etinawale project land. Number three, oil palm plan is a recipe for disaster. Number four, global power shift leads to security challenges. Number five, national small industry day. Number six, INS Airavat arrives at Ho Chi Minh city. Number seven, 102 one day Bharat trains to be operational by 2024. Number eight, Jal Jeevan mission promotes innovations and research and development. Number nine, eighth meeting of agricultural exports of BIMSTEC countries held. Dear friends, now let us understand all these articles in detail and to the point that is required for our civil services examination. And the first article that we would be discussing today is in relation to China because China is coming up with a new claim with respect to usage of South China Sea. Now let us say what is this news is all about. China to require foreign vessels to report in territorial waters. Dear friends, in this article, we need to understand what is the exact meaning of territorial waters. Not just this, we need to understand why this claim of China is disastrous or worrying factor for the trade activities of India and other countries. Before getting into the details of the article, let us understand with the help of the map, what is the new claim of China? So this is where we have India and the red ribbon that you see here is the South China Sea. Now, India does approximately around 55% of the trade activities through South China Sea. Now, China is claiming that in order to use South China Sea, we need to report to Chinese authorities, which was otherwise called as innocent movement. So earlier, we never used to report to China, but now China is claiming that we need to report to China to use South China Sea. Now, this is in brief about the issue created by China. Now, let us see what is this news is all about in detail. So in a move, that could have ramification for the free passage of both military and commercial vessels in the South China Sea, Chinese authorities said that they will require a range of vessels to report their information when passing through what China sees as its territorial waters starting from September 1. So starting from September 1, in order to move any vessels across what China is claiming to be their territorial waters, any country has to report their information to Chinese authorities. So this is the new claim made by India, China. Now, what is the importance or significance of this particular change? This is very, very important or significant change because over $5 trillion trade passes through South China Sea and 55% of India's trade pass through its waters and the Malacca Strait. This is according to estimates given by India's Ministry of External Affairs. Now, China claims, claims under a so-called nine dash line on its maps most of the South China Sea's waters, which are disputed by several other countries, including Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Now, what is nine dash line in brief? Let us imagine, so this is the South China Sea for an example. Now, China is coming up with a line that is called as nine dash line. Let us say there is a vessel from India that has to move across this nine dash line. Now they have to report to China before we use or cross this nine dash line. So that is what is the claim made by China recently. Now, is it in line with UN clause or violation of UN clause is what you need to understand next. Definitely it is the violation of UN clause. Now, what are the violations made by China? Let us understand the same. The first violation is 
deemed by most countries as being inconsistent with the united nations convention on the law of sea in short called as un clause which only gives states the right to establish a territorial sea up to 12 nautical miles let us say this is the sea area and the according to according to un clause it gives the jurisdiction of only 12 nautical miles to be claimed as their territorial waters but now china has gone even beyond 12 nautical miles to claim as their jurisdiction so that is in violation to un clause so that is the first violation and the second violation is the requirements of the latest notice will also be seen as being inconsistent with un clause which states that ships of all countries enjoy the right of innocent passage through territorial sea now what is this right to right of innocent passage right of innocent passage is nothing but passage of any vessels which should not harm the peace good order and security of the coastal state now the country china is saying that to use territorial sea they are not even allowing the right of innocent passage now why this is significant to india and other countries the peace and stability in the region is of great significance to india because india undertakes various activities here including cooperation in oil and gas sector with littoral states of the south china sea now let us understand the geography of this issue because there are a few terminology that we need to understand along with this issue now let us understand the terminology with the use of this picture let us imagine this is india just for an example and this is land area and this blue color one is the sea area and the line that separates the land and sea the the one that i been marking now in the red color is called as baseline so baseline is simply the separation of land mass to water now there are a few terminology that you need to understand first just understand the terminology after which i'll explain the significance of every zone number 1 we need to understand what is territorial sea number 2 we need to understand what is contiguous zone number 3 we need to understand exclusive economic zone number 4 we need to understand the meaning of internal international waters dear friends so this is the baseline from the baseline towards the sea to a distance of 12 12 nautical miles is called as territorial sea now from the baseline towards the sea distance of 24 nautical miles is called as contiguous zone from the baseline towards the sea 200 nautical miles is called as exclusive economic zone and what is international waters then international waters cover the outline of the territorial sea see this both lines are the margin of territorial sea from the outer line of territorial sea towards the sea any distance towards the sea is called as international waters now what is this internal waters internal waters is nothing but any water that is towards the land mass you can see this blue color shade this blue color shade that is towards the land side from the baseline is called as internal waters now let us understand the significance of each of these zones so let's start with what is the meaning of territorial waters the term territorial waters is sometimes used informally to refer to any area of water over which a state has jurisdiction including internal waters the territorial sea the contiguous zone the exclusive economic zone and potentially the continental shelf in a narrower sense the term is used as a synonym for territorial sea now let us understand every terminology in detail let's start with baseline what is baseline normally the baseline from which the territorial sea is measured is the low water line along the coast as marked on large scale charts officially recognized by the coastal state so this is the this is in uh, you know simple words the separation between the land and sea is called as baseline now what is internal waters 
what are land words i told you if this is the base line and this if this is a sea and if this is a land any water that is towards the land side is called as internal waters so what are land words of the baseline are defined as internal waters over which the state has complete sovereignty not even innocent passage is allowed without explicit permission from the said state lakes and rivers are considered internal waters next what is territorial sea territorial sea as defined by the 1982 united nations convention on the law of the sea is a belt of coastal waters extending at 12 nautical miles that is roughly equal to 22 kilometers or 14 miles from the baseline usually the mean low water mark of the coastal state the territorial sea is regarded as the sovereign territory of the state although foreign ships for the purpose of military and civilian are allowed innocent passage through it or transit passage for the straits this sovereignty also extends to the air space over and also seabed below so this is not only the jurisdiction of seabed this also includes the air space above the territorial sea now let us understand what is the meaning of contiguous zone and its significance the contiguous zone is a band of water extending farther from the outer edge of the territorial sea to up to 24 nautical miles that is equal to 44.4 kilometers or 27.6 miles from the baseline within which a state can exert limited control for the purpose of preventing or punishing infringement of its customs fiscal immigration or sanitary laws and regulations within its territory or territorial sea now what is exclusive economic zone an exclusive economic zone extends from the baseline to a maximum of 200 nautical miles that is equal to 370.4 kilometers or 230.2 miles thus it includes the contiguous zone as well so Uh, exclusive economic zone includes contiguous zone as well a coastal nation has control of all economic resources that is the reason why it is called as economic zone so the coastal state will have all the rights of using economic resources within its exclusive economic zone including fishing mining oil exploration and any pollution of those resources now let us understand what is continental shelf the continental shelf of a coastal nation extends out to the outer edge of the continental margin but at least 200 and 200 nautical miles that is equal to 370 kilometers or 230 miles from the baseline of the territorial sea if the continental margin does not stretch that far coastal states have the right of exploration and exploitation of seabed and the natural resources that lie on or beneath it however other states may lay cables and pipelines if they are authorized by the coastal states so the outer limit of countries continental shelf so this is what you need to you know learn again the outer limit of the continental shelf shall not stretch beyond 350 nautical miles that is approximately equal to 650 kilometers or 400 miles of the baseline so these are all the terminology that we understood so far now if i come back to the map again so this is india and this is south china sea if the, if it is just the territorial region of the chinese sea they have come beyond their territorial region to claim and asking every other country to give information about their trade activities so this is in violation with the un clause now let us understand more about south china sea the south china sea is a marginal sea of the western pacific ocean now it is bounded in north by shores of south china so that is the reason why it is called as south china sea see in the north it is bounded by south china so that is the reason why it is called as south china sea in the west by indo chinese peninsula so in the west it has 
Indo Chinese Peninsula in the east by the islands of Taiwan and northwestern Philippines. So, in the east, it has Taiwan and northwestern Philippines. In the south, by Borneo, eastern Sumatra, and Bangka Belitung Islands. So, this is where in the south part of the South China Sea. Now, it communicates with. So, what are the communications of this particular or connections with other uh, parts of the sea or straits that we can call it as? The Eastern China Sea via Taiwan Strait. The Philippine Sea, it connects to Philippine Sea via Luzon Strait. The Sulu Sea via straits around Palawan, example, Mindoro and Balabak Strait. The Strait of Malacca via Strait of Singapore and the Java Sea via Karimata and Bangka Strait. Now, the South China Sea is a region of tremendous economic and geostrategic importance because one third of the world's maritime shipping passes through it, carrying over 3 trillion US dollars in trade each year. So you can imagine, 3 trillion US dollars trade each year. Huge oil and natural gas reserves are believed to, to lie beneath its seabed. It also contains lucrative fisheries, which are crucial for the food security of millions of Southeast Asia. Now, the Paracel Island are disputed between China, Taiwan, and Vietnam. Let us see the disputed areas of South China Sea. So here we have Paracel Island. So this Paracel Island is the disputed island between China, then we have Taiwan here, here, and then we have Vietnam here. That is one disputed island. Second disputed island is uh, Scarborough Shoal. So it is here Scarborough Shoal. So this is again disputed area between Philippines, China, and Taiwan. So we have Philippines here, we have China here, we have Taiwan here. Next we have uh, Spa Spratly High Islands. So Spratly Islands is here. And this is again the disputed island among uh, Vietnam, China, and Taiwan. Now, some or all of the islands themselves are also disputed between uh, Vietnam, China, Taiwan, Brunei, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Now, what is the territorial claim of China? Let us see the same. Both the People's Republic of China, that means mainland of China, and Republic of China, that is commonly known as Taiwan, claim almost the entire body as their own, demarcating their claims within what is known as nine dash line, which claims overlap with virtually every other country in the region. So you can see this uh, red color line. So the one which I am uh, marking now in red is called as nine dash line. And other colored lines, like this is the yellow color line, probably the Malaysian claim. So this is overlapping here. Then uh, Vietnam, the blue color line. So this is also overlapping. Then uh, Philippines, so this violet or uh, purple color line. So this is also overlapping. That means the China's nine dash line is overlapping the jurisdiction of every other country. So this is the issue that is in violation with the UN clause. So this is what is the claim of the China. And with this, let us move to the second article of this session. So second issue of uh, today's session is no social impact study for 495 acres of Etinole project land. Now let us understand what is the implications of this. So there is there has been a project that is called as Etinole, but this Etinole project has been, uh, it has bypassed social impact study of approximately around 495 acres. Let us see what this issue is all about. And the officials say skipping it can save one year activity and one year and activists are not happy about it. The state government has planned to sidestep social impact assignment in short called as SIA for the acquisition of 495 acres of land in an apparent bid to expedite the long pending Etinole project. Now, why are they sidestepping this particular assessment? Because officials believe that skipping the 
social impact assessment will save them at least one years of time. But is it true or is it good with the activists? No. Now, how can they bypass this social impact assessment? Social impact assessment is prerequisite for land acquisition as per the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2013. However, in 2019, the previous Congress JDS coalition amended the state act, giving the government the power to skip social impact assessment for projects broadly classified under irrigation, drinking water, educational institutions, and among, among others. So if any project that comes under these particular categories, there was an amendment in the year 2019, the government has the power to bypass social impact assessment. And now, so this is irrigation and drinking water related projects. So that is the reason why the government is planning to bypass social impact assessment. Now, what is this Etinavale project is all about? The Etinavale project aims to provide drinking water to Chikmangluru, Tumkuru, Bangalore Rural, Ramnagar, Chikbalapur and Kolar districts from the Etinavale stream, the tributary of Netravati River in Asan district. The project has especially spe seen stiff resistance from farmers in the region over land compensation leading to challenges in acquisition. The Land Acquisition Act provides for rehabilitation and resettlement under the second schedule of the legislation, while as per the first schedule, the land owner is merely compensated for the land lost. Under the second schedule, the aggrieved party is eligible for one-time settlement or a house or employment among other compensatory measures depending on the context. So the whole premise for applying the second schedule, the social impact is the social impact assessment. Now, Ethinole project is based on the report submitted by the committee headed by Dr. G.S. Paramashivaya. This project involves construction of eight small dams, two on Ethinole, two on Kadumane Hole, one on Kari Hole, one on Wangada Hole, and two more on its tributaries. From these storage dams, the water is pumped to three delivery chambers. From these chambers, water is again lifted to Harwana Halli Reservoir near Sakleshpura. From here, water flow flows downwards through gravity towards Tumkuru. Near Devana Durga, a reservoir is constructed for storage of water. From here, water is channeled through the rivers of Nandi Durga. This project mainly provides drinking water for Asan, Tumkur, Kolar, Chikbalapur, Bangalore Rural, and Ramnagar districts. The project proposed to lift 24.01 TMC FT of water from Ethinavale, a west flowing stream near Sakleshpur in Asan district and transport it through hardened steel pipe and open canal running to a distance of 274 kilometers. The Karnataka government proposed to spend 12,931 crores on the project which is expected to provide permanent solution to drinking water shortage in six districts. Now, the environmental impacts and controversies surrounding the project are huge. Now, what are they? Number one, ecological imbalance because of felling thousands of trees from dense forest of Western Ghats. Number two, alteration of river course resulting in habitat fragmentation. Number three, it may dry the upper course of Gundia River and impacts the life of people living in the area. Next, water logging and increased salinity near the storage area. The diversion will decrease the water flow into the Arabian Sea and this could increase the salinity of the Netravati River, which is considered the lifeline of Dakshin Kannan district. So this is what is the second article of the day. So Ethinavale project, they have 
or they are trying to bypass social impact assessment and these are the impacts of bypassing this assessment now let's go to news number 3 news number 3 is related to center's decision to plant oil palm now what is this news is all about oil palm plan is a recipe for disaster environmental activists and politicians raise concern over center's proposal now center is coming up with a proposal to plant more oil palm to compensate or to meet the demands of oil requirement in the country now what is it going to cause damage to the environment is what we are supposed to discuss in this article so given the widespread destruction of rainforests and native biodiversity caused by oil palm plantations in southeast asia environmental experts and politicians are warning that the union governments move to promote their cultivation in the north northeastern states and in the andaman and nicobar islands can be disastrous because there is an example already in southeast asia that it affected the biodiversity just because of planting palm plants palm trees to generate oil production other concerns include the impact on community ownership of tribal lands as well as the fact that the oil palm is water guzzling that means it takes lot of water and it is monoculture crop that means it doesn't allow any other crops to grow like uh, eucalyptus with a long gestation period unsuitable for fall, small farmers that means you will not get yield immediately it takes a lot of time that is called as gestation period so that is unsuitable for small farmers because small farmers cannot wait for that long however the government has its own justification the government says the land productivity for palm oil is higher than that for oil seeds now what are the oil seeds that we are growing in india for uh, oil source you know the oil palm has more productivity and yield compared to oil seeds that we are growing natively in india and the land identified for oil palm plantation in the northeastern states is already cleared for cultivation that means they are not acquiring any land this land that they are demarked demarked for oil plantation oil palm plantation is clear for cultivation and 11040 crore national mission on edible oil oil palm is the amount of money that the center is expected to spend on this particular plantation and there is one more concern the concern is the focus areas were biodiversity hotspots and ecologically fragile and oil palm plantations would denude forest car and destroy the habitat of endangered wildlife is one one more concerns with respect to this particular project it could also detach tribes people from their identity linked with the community ownership of land and wreak havoc on the social fabric now the palm is an invasive species it is not a natural for forest product of northeastern india and its impact on our biodiversity as well as on soil conditions has to be analyzed even if it is grown in non forest areas any kind of monoculture plantation is not desirable so this is what is the activists claim about this program of central government now a study done by indian council of agricultural research recommended 28 lakh hectares across the country where oil palm can be cultivated out of which only 9 lakh hectares are in northeastern states this 9 lakh hectares is not being given by cutting forests or other crops this land is available for cultivation so this is what the center says now what is the significance of this move we are we have to fill huge gap in production versus demand of edible oil soon we will have to venture into crops where production is more the production of palm oil from 1 hectare is far greater than the production of mustard oil in the same area so that is the reason why to reduce the gap between demand and supply center is coming up with this program 
palm oil currently makes up a whopping 55 percentage of india's edible oil imports and the new mission is in, in intended to move towards domestic production and self reliance so we are importing approximately around 55 percentage of the palm oil now this mission is intended to move domestic production and self reliance so we can generate our own oil requirement however in january 2019 so this is with respect to the same issue in the union territory in the year 2019 january a letter to the agriculture department the chief conservator of forests of union territory pointed out that much of these lands are protected or reserved forests and any land use changes would require the approval of the supreme court whose 2002 order had directed the existing plantation whether of oil palm rubber teak should be phased out so this was the earlier uh, directions by the supreme court in 2002 where it ordered to remove oil palm rubber and teak in these areas the land should be regenerated to its natural profile without any further introduction of exotic species this palm tree is known to be exotic species but supreme court has already said in 2002 order to remove such exotic species the reason is to regenerate its natural profile now let us see what is the status of palm oil cultivation in india right now in andhra pradesh which currently grows more than 90 percentage of indian oil palm farmers dependent on bore well irrigation it is not natural irrigation or rain water irrigation they are majorly dependent on bore well irrigation and andhra pradesh is the state that produces 90 percentage of the indian oil palm right now oil palm requires 300 liters of water per tree per day this is huge one tree takes up to 300 liters per day as well as high pesticide use in areas where it is not a native crop leading to consumer health concerns as well the high levels of investment and long wait for high returns tend to attract large corporate investors while small cultivators have struggled with the long gestation period and have required heavy, heavy government support if similar subsidies and supports are extended to oil seeds which are indigenous to india and suited for dry land agriculture they can help achieve self reliance without depending on oil palm now there is a mission that's called as national mission on edible oil oil palm now what does it say national edible oil mission oil palm for self reliance in edible oil involves investment of over 11000 crores over 5 year years period india is the largest consumer of vegetable oil in the world of this palm oil imports are almost 55 percentage of its total vegetable oil imports india produces less than half of the roughly 2.4 crore tons of edible oil that it it consumes annually it imports the rest buying palm oil from indonesia and malaysia so we are buying palm oil from indonesia and malaysia soya oil from uh, brazil and argentina and sunflower oil mainly from russia and ukraine now in india 94.1 percentage of its palm oil is used in food products especially for cooking purposes this makes palm oil extremely critical to india's edible oil economy what are the objectives of this scheme to harness domestic edible oil prices that are dictated by expensive palm oil imports to raise the domestic production of palm oil by 3 times to 11 lakh metric ton by 2025 26 it is expected to incentivize production of palm oil to reduce dependence on imports and help farmers cash in on the huge market this will involve raising the area under oil palm cultivation to 10 lakh hectares by 
2025-26 and 16.7 lakh hectares by 29-30. And the special emphasis of the scheme will be in India's northeastern states and Andaman and Nicobar Islands due to the conducive weather conditions in the region. So in this region, there is conducive weather that helps or that shoots growth of palm trees. Under this scheme, oil palm farmers will be provided financial assistance and will get remuneration under a price and variability formula. So this is the news about this particular issue. With this, let us move on to the next issue of this session. So the next issue is related to uh, Quad. So global power shift leads to security challenges. Now, why we have taken this news to discuss more about Quad? The ongoing Afghanistan spat reiterates the importance of quadrilateral group, keeping these things in mind. Now, what is the significance or relevance? Quad's relevance, the changing equations in Afghanistan are a recent and important example of this. These circumstances have forced every country to think on its strategy today. Quad has been constituted keeping these things in mind. We all know what is happening in Afghanistan. So keeping these things in mind, so we have constituted Quad is what the government is saying. Now let us understand more about Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, QSD also in short known as Quad, is a strategic dialogue between the United States, Japan, Australia and India that is maintained by talks between member countries. The dialogue was paralleled by joint military exercise of an unprecedented scale titled Exercise Malabar. So this quad also has joint military exercise and that is titled as Malabar. The diplomatic and military arrangements was widely viewed as the response to, in, to increased Chinese economic and military power. The dialogue was initiated in 2007 by the then Prime Minister of Japan, Shinjo Abe, with the support of the then Vice President of USA, Dick Cheney, the then Prime Minister of Australia, John Howards, and then Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Now, quadrilateral security dialogue has Australia, India, Japan, United States that are marked in blue, India, Australia, Japan, and United States. And this was established in 2007, but in 2017, it was re-established after negotiations in November. And this is Intergovernmental Security Forum. Now, let us understand about Malabar Naval Exercise because this is part of Quad. Exercise Malabar is a trilateral naval exercise involving the United States, Japan, India as permanent members. The annual Malabar exercises include diverse activities ranging from fighter combat operations from aircraft carriers through maritime interdiction operations, anti-submarine warfare, diving salvage operations, amphibious operations, counter piracy operations, cross deck helicopter landings and anti-air warfare operations. Originally began in 1992 as a bilateral exercise between India and United States. It started as bilateral exercise in 1992 between India and United States. The exercise was expanded in 2007 with the participation of Japan, Singapore, Australia. Japan become a permanent partner in the year 2015. Australia participated in the exercise again in 2020, marking the second time that the Quad will be jointly participating in military exercise. So that was the news about Quad. With this, let us move to news number five. So this is in relation to Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, the observation of national small industry day. Now, what is this MSME? MSME are an integral part of the value chain offering diversified products on one hand and delivering intermediate goods for the large scale industries on the other. It is one of the largest employment generator and backbone of Indian economy. 
it is home for more than 6.3 crore msmes which have the ability and capability to assess international markets and work as ancillaries to larger international firms in terms of exports the sector holds highest potential in various sub sectors such as textile leather and leather goods pharmaceuticals automotive gems and jewelers etc with overall contribution of 45 percentage now there was revised classification of msme that was effective from 1st july 2020 let us see what is msme in the revised classification number 1 it is known as manufacturing enterprises and enterprises rendering services it has both manufacturing sector and also service sector now it is divided as micro small and medium now what do you mean by micro investment in plant and machinery or equipment not more than 1 crore so investment in machinery and equipment which should not exceed 1 crore and the turnover should not exceed 5 crore so this is in 1 is to 5 so investment of 1 crore and turnover of 5 crore 1 is to 5 is called as micro then what is small investment in plant and machinery or equipment not more than 10 crore once again 10 crore of investment and not more than the turnover of 50 crore so 10 is to 50 that is once again equal to 1 is to 5 range now what is medium investment in plant and machinery or equipment not more than 50 crore and the turnover should not exceed 250 crore and this is once again 1 is to 5 so this is the new revised classification applicable with effective from 1st july 2021 so this is about ministry of micro small and medium enterprises so let us get into the news number 6 that is related to ministry of defense ins airavat arrives at ho chi minh city vietnam with covid relief supplies now what is this program is all about. so as a part of ongoing mission sagar i'll explain you what is sagar in detail so this activity is as a part of ongoing mission of sagar ins airavat arrived at ho chi minh city port in vietnam with covid relief materials on 30th august 2021 ins airavat an indigenously built landing ship tank under the eastern naval command based at visakhapatnam is on a deployment to southeast asia for transshipment of covid relief aid as a part of government of india's vision of sagar sagar in the sense security and growth for all in the region the indian navy has been proactively engaging with countries in the region and has been at the forefront of numerous humanitarian missions spanning the entire extent of indian ocean including south or southeast asia and east africa now what is sagar in detail sagar is security and growth for all in the region is india's policy or doctrine of maritime cooperation in the indian ocean region what are its recent operations as a part of sagar the indian navy has assisted countries in the indian ocean region with exclusive economic zone surveillance search and rescue and other such activities and it is mainly focusing on covid-19 relief mission in the month of may 2020 india dispatched ins kesari carrying on board 600 tons of food items two medical assistance teams and essential medicines to two countries to the countries in southern india ocean as part of mission sagar initiative this relief mission provided assistance to mauritius maldives madagascar comoros and siachules on 17 august 2020 india extended its support to mauritius government by sending 30 tons of technical equipment and materials supplementing the oil spill con- containment and salvage operation india dispatched ocean booms river booms heli skimmers 
power packs, blowers, salvage packs, oil absorbent, graphene pads, and other accessories on board C-17 Globemaster of Indian Air Force. So this is with respect to the initiative on humanity grounds of the government of India that is in short called as Sagar. Now let's go to news number seven, 102 Vande Bharat trains to be operational by 2024. Now what is this news is all about? The railways plans to operate 102 Vande Bharat trains by March 2024. The train 18, later named as Vande Bharat Express, it was named as train 18 earlier, later it is renamed as Vande Bharat Express, was rolled out by the Integral Coach Factory Chennai. It was showcased as India's first semi-high-speed train with an operational efficiency of 160 kilometers and a game changer. So with this, let us move to the next news of today. So the next news is about uh, Ministry of Jal Shakti and the news is Jal Jeevan Mission promotes innovations and research and development. Now let us see what is this news is all about. So this news is the program wherein since August 2019, Government of India is implementing Jal Jeevan Mission in partnership with states to make provisions for tap water supply to every rural home of the country by 2024. To realize the goal of the mission with speed and scale, to increase the spe speed and the magnitude amidst the diverse challenges that are encountered require innovative technologies and solutions. To assist the implementation agencies, a technical committee under the chairmanship of principal scientific advisor of advisor to government of India has been constituted under Jal Jeevan mission to identify new technologies and select high end research and development proposals for funding. The committee has representatives from scientific departments of government of India, IITs, state governments, Niti Aayog, NGOs, and UNICEF. Now, what is Jal Jeevan Mission? As we told in the earlier slide, to give tap water to all villages by 2024. Apart from that, the program will also implement source sustainability measures as mandatory elements such as recharge and reuse through grey water management. Grey water management, grey water is nothing but water that has been already used for some purpose. So to reuse the grey water, water conservation, rainwater harvesting. The Jal Jeevan mission will be based on a community approach to water and will include extensive information, education and communication as key component of the mission. Jal Jeevan Mission looks to create a Jan Andolan for water, thereby making it everyone's priority. Now, what are the objectives of this mission? Number one, to provide FHTC to every rural household. That means functional tap connection. To prioritize provisions of functional tap connection in quality affected areas like villages in drought prone and desert areas, Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojan villages, etc. To provide functional tap connections to schools, Anganwadi centers, Gram Panchayat buildings, health centers, wellness centers, and community buildings. And let us come to the last news of today's discussion that is related to Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. Eighth meeting of agricultural experts of BIMSTEC countries held. Agricultural experts stress on deepening cooperation in agriculture sector for food and nutrition security in the region. India hosted eighth meeting of agricultural experts of Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economical Cooperation, BIMSTEC countries virtually. Now, let us understand more about BIMSTEC. What is BIMSTEC? The BIMSTEC provides a unique link between South and Southeast Asia with five countries, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka from South Asia and two countries, Myanmar and Thailand 
from Southeast Asia coming together on one platform for cooperation in 14 key economic and social sectors of economy. The BIMSTEC was founded in 1997 with an ambition to pursue mutual trade, connectivity and culture, technical and economic development in the region. Initially, six sectors like trade, technology, energy, transportation, tourism and fisheries were included for spectral cooperation, which was later expanded to 14 areas of cooperation. Agriculture is one of the 14 sectors. Now, what is BIMSTEC Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation? Let us understand the history and complete details about BIMSTEC. BIMSTEC is an international organization of seven South Asian and Southeast Asian nations housing 1.73 billion people and having a combined gross domestic product of $3.8 trillion estimated in the year 2021. The leadership is rotated in alphabetical order of the country name. The permanent secretary at is in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And this is the logo of BIMSTEC and the green color marking that you can see here on the world map are the BIMSTEC member countries. Now, uh, on 6 June 1997, the new sub-regional grouping was formed in Bangkok under the name BISTEC actually. It was there as BISTEC before that includes Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka and Thailand economic cooperation. After which, following the inclusion of Myanmar on 22nd December 1997, during a special ministerial meeting in Bangkok, the group was renamed BIMSTEC economic cooperation that includes Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and Thailand economic cooperation. In 1998, Nepal became an observer. observer. In February 2004, Nepal and Bhutan became full members. On 31st July 2004, in the first summit, the grouping was renamed as BIMSTEC or Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. Now, these are the countries that are there presently in Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. The headquarters is in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and the official language is English. Now, the chairmanship is under Sri Lanka since September 2018, and General Sec Secretary Gen General is Tanzin Lakfel, is from Bhutan, and it is established on uh, in 6 June 1997, it is approximately around 24 years ago. Now, what are the objectives of BIMSTEC? I told you that there are 14 main sectors of BIMSTEC to name all trade and investment, transportation and communication, energy, tourism, technology, fishery, agriculture, public health, poverty alleviation, counter-terrorism and uh, transnational crime, environment and disaster management, people-to-people -people contact, cultural cooperation and climate change. So these are the areas under which BIMSTEC is working all together. So this is the news and details about the first week, September current affairs 2021. If you have any doubts, you can uh, ask me in the comment section and uh, the chairmanship of BIMSTEC, as I told you before, it will be rotated in the alphabetical order of every country starting from Bangladesh in 1997. And cooperation with Asian Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank becomes the partner in 2005 to undertake BIMSTEC transport infrastructure and logistics study, which was completed in 2014. And BIMSTEC summits were held at different places. First uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, next in India, New Delhi, Third was in Myanmar, Nepidov, and fourth was in Nepal, Kathmandu, and next BIMSTEC to be held in Sri Lanka, Colombo. So with this, I am concluding this session. Any doubts, you can put in comments box. We will try to reply to your questions. Thanks for watching. Namaste.